All right. Welcome everybody to today's talk. We are we're so excited to have you here. Um, the talk is entitled "The Intersection of Ancient Traditions and Psychedelic Therapy." We are very lucky to have two speakers today. Uh, first, we have Belinda Aracho, who is of Diné or Navajo and Ashiwi or Pueblo of Zuni descent. She lives in Arizona and is the wisdom carrier, healer, and founder of Kologi LLC. She holds degrees in health sciences, in technology, and in public health. She has participated in MAPS uh, MDMA People of Color Therapy Training Program and is an international speaker on issues that impact Native Americans in the US. Uh, additionally, she is one of the founding members and a member of the board of directors for the Church of the Eagle and the Condor, uh, which is a deeply compelling community I encourage you to learn more about. Um, she's authored several recent articles um, on sharuna.net, uh, considerations for psychedelic therapists when working with Native American people and communities, guidelines for inclusion of indigenous people in psychedelic science conferences, um, and this is not Native American history, this is US history with Belinda Aracho. So we're very excited to hear from her first and following her, we will hear from Dr. Snehal Bhatt, who is an addiction psychiatrist working and teaching at the University of New Mexico, where he is the medical director of the addiction and substance abuse program. He has helped lead several trials investigating the use of psilocybin for the treatment of alcohol use disorder and is developing further trials to assess efficacy of psychedelic therapy in a range of addictive disorders. Throughout this work, he's been deeply engaged with questions of policy change and has been addressing barriers to addiction treatment in rural and indigenous populations and improving access for them. So we're very excited to hear them in conversation together today, um, these two wonderful speakers. And we hope that as you listen, um, and you have any questions, which we'll have time to answer at the end, you place them in the Q&A box and we'll invite you up to ask them at the end. We'll also have a debrief um, in a, a, a for, for longer discussion at 5.30 today, which was in the original email invitation. So with that, um, I give you our wonderful speakers. Yat e bene she ya balindi aracho yene shian. Ya at e bene means ya. At e dene means the um the surface of the heavens. Dene is the other piece of it, which is the earth. And as human beings, we are the connection between the two. And so I come with um, special greetings and thank you all for inviting me to this um, presentation today. Um, before I get started, I wanted to do a land acknowledgement to acknowledge the original people that still live in the Phoenix area. I want to um, acknowledge the Otum people, the Peeposh, the Akchin, and the Fort McDowell, the Avapai Nation. It is, uh, you know, common for us as Indigenous people and Native American people to honor the ancestral territories in which we all live. We each live in an area that was uh, belonged to the original people of, of wherever you reside. Um, as I go through this presentation today, I ask that you come with uh, um, the ability to learn with a child's mind. Um, what I'm about to explain and teach is something that is out of the ordinary for many of you. Um, and some of the belief systems are not typically something that you're used to. Um, and as we go through this presentation, if there is something that emotionally um, resonates within your, your, your being, I ask that you acknowledge that and kind of ask yourself, why is that? Um, because I think it's uh, an opportunity for some personal learning. There's a couple of topics. I'm not going to read through this list, but I want to provide you with some basic understanding of um, where we come from as Native American people, go through some terminology, talk about colonization, what, what is cultural appropriation, a cultural appreciation and talk about some of the results of exploitation and then talk a little bit more in depth about some of the um, pieces that are associated with um, psychedelic therapy. Um, 
And in order for us to kind of proceed, one of the things that I, I wanted to spend some time doing is talking a little bit about some common terminology that I may be using that you might not be familiar with. Um, I use the term plant medicine to mean all plants that are typically here in Native American and indigenous cultures. The plants are really here to heal humanity. And when you really think about it from a medical standpoint, um, a lot of the medicines, prescriptions that are derived from plants are actually that. Um, in addition, I will also use the term sacred plant medicine. And these are making reference to the ethnogens and the psychedelics known in, in Western, uh, the Western world. We have a different relationship with that and I'll go into that in a little bit. Medicine, um, we all have our own perceptions of what medicine means in Native American cultures. Medicine means the essence of life or the inner power that creates everything that a living being has. Um, each of us as human beings create our own way of life and presence, um, a way that is chosen in spirit and then lived out in physical form. And that's so important to when we start to get to talking about healing. Medicine can also mean physical remedies such as plants, um, you know, different types of uh, medications, for instance. Um, but it's what gives a person their inner power. Medicine can also be every plant, every rock, every animal, every person. It could be the elements of air, water, fire. Um, those are all medicines. But medicine can also be the experiences, whether they're happy or unpleasant experiences, that really give us life lessons um, that help us to grow as human beings. So I wanted to lay that out. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about ceremony. Um, you know, it's a little bit different, um, and I equate ceremony to psychotherapy. So if you can kind of come from that mindset, and sometimes it's a little bit hard to make that analogy, but um, we'll go. It, it'll become clearer as we go through this presentation. So I want to talk a little bit about the classifications of plants um, in my Diné culture, which is a um, matrilinear um, society. Um, it is said that plants are jewelry adorned on the earth of Mother Earth and changing woman, which in our culture is the first woman. The large trees represent her lungs, and this is, in fact, a scientific fact. Um, the large trees um, actually give off oxygen that we inhale, and then we expire carbon dioxide. And the tall grasses represent her hair. During healing, ceremony to, healing ceremonies, the holy plants are used as a catalyst for strengthening our four bodies, which are the mental, the physical, the spiritual, and, and the emotional body. And that's also key to the healing of um, people that come to us or to our traditional healers. The roots of the plants are analogous to the veins and the arteries that provide nourishment of life. And so if you can imagine, you know, the roots reaching down into the earth, that's really what gives us the essence of, of life. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about, uh, um, about plants. Um, there are essentially four, three classifications that I want to focus on. The first one is actually in regards to ceremonial. Um, according to um, Mormon's book on Native American ethnobotany, there are 2,582 species of plants that are used for medicinal purposes. Um, this first classification also includes um, plants that are used for ceremony or rituals, such as peyote, ayahuasca, etc. Speaking scientifically about sacred plant medicines, Native American people in this country have been using mescal be, um, beans, sorrel cactus, sea flag grasses, and flowers such as poppy seeds, belladonna, morning glories for thousands of years. In addition, we also use sacred tobacco, sage as part of the ceremonies and rituals that we um, go through. I wanted to talk a little bit about peyote a little bit more to give you a context as, as an example um, going forward. It is hard to determine when Native American people began using sacred plant medicines, particularly peyote in the United States. We need to keep in mind that the Southwest United States did not become a part of the union until 1854. 
However, peyote has been used by a number of tribes in the United States for various purposes. The Comanche, the Omaha, the Winnebago, the Blackfoot, and the Ponca use it as ceremonial medicines. The Kiowa used it as a allergesic and anti and, and, and also a rheumatary um, type of medication. They also use it as a cold remedy and for um, dermatological issues. It was also used for gastrointestinal issues, gripe, scarlet fever, um, bruises, and pneumonia. The first Western recorded um, history of the use of peyote was actually by a Franciscan missionary during the Spanish conquest of Mexico in 1577. In 1620, the Roman Catholic Church considered peyote, quote, an evil to be rooted out in the new world and promulgated laws that forbid the, the religious use of peyote. Eventually, peyote made its way to Mexico into the Rio Grande area, onto the Great Plains and into many tribes, even including Can Canadian tribes, First Nations. Many tribes refer to these sacred the sacred plant as medicine, Father Peyote. And in my culture, we refer to it as Shema Azed, which means and translates to mother medicine. And so as you can start to see, there's a relationship, a one-to-one -one personal relationship with these plant medicines that is so key and fundamental as we move forward and we talk about healing. Many tribes refer to plant medicines as relatives. Until we all can appreciate the sacred plant medicines as relatives, we are at our own demise. Other points I wanted to offer are most pharmaceuticals that we use today are derived from plants. Unfortunately, what happens is the big pharma companies put patents on these medicines and charge enormous amounts of money and make it inaccessible for those that actually need them. Back to the use of plants during ceremony, when our plant relatives are used for healing, we harvest them in a sacred way. Usually we offer a chant, we offer um, some type of offering like cornmeal for the taking of their life. And we also let the plant know what, that, what their plant medicine is gonna actually be used for and who it's gonna be used for. This way we show respect and reverence throughout the entire process. We in the Western society are a very throwaway society. And during the manufacturing of any type of products, we often come from the mindset of cradle to grave. And one of the things that's so important, especially when we're talking about these sacred plants medicines for us to kind of keep in mind is that in most indigenous cultures and Native American cultures, we think about the process from cradle to cradle. And everything that we do, so when we're harvesting the plants, we always think about it. How do we give back to the plant so it can re-nourish and be available for the next seven generations? And so that is one of the things that we'll be talking a little bit more about, about the commodification of these sacred plant medicines. How does the cradle to cradle process relate to, psychedel to the psychedelic movement? It's simple. We need to realize that we don't have an endless supply of peyote or an endless supply of ayahuasca. Let's keep in mind that there are other practices such as breath work that allow us to experience healing and have an encounter with the divine. And I think a lot of times that's really what a lot of people are after. Um, one last point that I wanted to, to make about the sacred plant medicines. I mentioned earlier from a Native American perspective that all things are related. There's an interconnectedness between all things. It is a sacred relationship that we have as human beings to everything that exists around us. If you work or you plan to work with these sacred plant medicines, it is important that you have the right relationship with these plants. Otherwise, it compromises the healing process. So intention is everything. So if you go in with the intention and you go out and you harvest a plant, the whole process or the idea is that if you don't have good intentions when you're harvesting the plant, the energy of that, um, of however you're picking that plant will also go um, travel within that plant as you're working with the individual to do personal healing. So that is the reason why from the very onset it's so important. 
In addition, the two other classifications that I've noted here are they're also used for food or subsistence. And then the other one is they're used for uh, utilitarian purposes. Many of the long grasses are actually used for back basketry. So using it in that thing. Oh, my favorite topic, colonialization. <laughs> Um, this is something that is very near and dear to my, my heart because I have a personal experience and I'll share that a little bit with you. It is important to have a basic historical context as it relates to religious freedoms in the United States for Native American people. We all come from a shared history with different perspectives of that history. For most Native Americans in this country, we continue to see and experience unfair policies and lack of acknowledgement of historical events Impose a, imposed upon us. Duran Duran offers um, an, a, a format in which it can help to assist us in understanding the events in US history that have impacted Native Americans in this country. And this specifically relates to the trauma aspect. First contact. During this period, Native people's lives were destroyed through genocidal military actions. This did not allow the people to grieve for their losses as more traumatic events continued. Action by US military, like issuing blankets laced with smallpox, resulted in thousands of deaths for Native American people. And this is actually documented in a lot of the um, military officers' records. The second one, economic competition. During this phase, Native Americans suffered the loss of subsistence both physically and spiritually. An example, in my Diné, people were impacted by the scorched earth policies. In order to um, have them surrender and be placed at Fort Sumner, known as Huete in our language, which means the land of suffering in New Mexico. This event has impacted me personally and my family. My great grandmother, Bishtibal, that was her name, she, the name translate as she joined the warriors, was born at Huete. She was born in 1867. Her family were considered prisoners in wards of the United States. At the age of two years old, her and her family members arrived back in the Southern Arizona once they were released from this internment camp. So the story goes is that it took her family approximately two years to walk back from Fort Sumner to New Mexico in Southern Arizona. And a lot of times all they had was just the clothes on their back. Many of them didn't have shoes. And so we lost a lot of um, relatives, including grandparents, which is be another point that I wanted to bring up a little bit later. The third phase is the reservation period. Native American people were forced to live on reservations which is a piece of land that is actually held in trust by Native American people. We don't own the land. Um, so I, this one misconception I wanted to clarify. Um, as the American expanded westward, more and more Native American people were placed on reservations. This kept the Native people from moving from one place to another and in, impacted their connection to the earth, connection to the herds that were hunted and the plants that they used to sustain themselves. The next phase is actually the boarding school period. And many of you may have, have seen this if you're um, on social media, you, you hear about residential schools. Residential schools were schools that were, um, were built in the Canadian provinces. Here in the United States, we had a similar that was called boarding schools. Um, and this, to this day, really angers me because it also, again, impacted my family. My mom was sent to a boarding school during this period, children as young as three and four years old were removed from their homes and the care of their parents and placed in distance boarding schools as part of the US policy. And a lot of times they were never allowed to go back home. Children were forced into colonial life and our culture was viewed as inferior and evil. Children were starved, chained and beaten. There is a huge issue that is slowly being exposed in the United States and in Canada right now, as there's, you know, one of the things that they're doing right now with the Corps of Engineer is help. They're actually um, exhuming most small little bodies and uh, their families were never notified when these children were, were 
died um, for one reason or another. And then the very last piece is the forced relocation and termination period. During the 1950s, Native American people were relocated from reservations into metropolitan areas with the intent to assimilate them and remove them from their connection to their cultures. And a lot of times they made promises of them having housing, scholarships, jobs. And when they arrived, there was nothing there for them. And so they ended up returning a lot of times back to the reservation. What are the effects of colon colonialization? Well, first of all, there's the health conditions. We have chronic health conditions that remain very high, including diabetes, heart disease, chronic lower respiratory issues. In a distance, there's a high prevalence of substance abuse, and I'm, I'm sure Sonal will touch on this. Native Americans have higher rates of and continue to die of chronic liver diseases and cirrhosis, including homicide and intentional self-harm and suicide. This picture below is actually an illustration of some children that were removed from their reservation and they were sent to Carlisle Indian School, which is one of the schools in Pennsylvania. And that's the same picture on the far right hand side. And this um, slogan, kill the en enemy and save the man was actually the government's policy, again, to assimilate Native American children. And this really touched at the fabric of Native American um, families. Um, the other thing is impact to family structures that I wanted to talk about. In our traditional Diné culture, the women's role in a family is the, her responsibilities for the physical and the intellectual aspects of a family. The men in our family are responsible for the spiritual and the emotional aspects of a family. And we are so far away from, from that. It's, typically, it's just completely flip-flop the other way. And so what happens is when you go through these traumatic experiences, we no longer know who we are. And many of us, like such as myself, um, being that I have to function in two worlds and in a, in a familiar with a corporate world and a traditional world, um, it's kind of like being um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. There were times when I went back to the reservation as I traveled back to the reservation. In my mind, I had to go through this mental transformation of my role that I was going back to. And then on Sunday, when I would come back to the city to my corporate job, I would have to go through that same experience. I had to, you know, toughen up and be the person that was ready to do my, my job and be outspoken, which was contrary to the way that um, we interact with our families. And then the last part of this is that it threatens culture and identity. And, and I don't think I need to explain that any more than I already have. Because Europeans and others did not understand our culture and traditions, there was a direct infringement and sometimes prohibition on our ceremonies and rituals. Ceremonies that have been practiced for centuries by our people in this continent. One of the things I wanted to touch on as a, as a case in point um, with regards to policy, because this, this does get at the um, crux of um, freedom of religion um, as it relates to psychedelic use. In the First Amendment, it reads, Congress shall make no laws respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or the freedom of speech or of press or the right of people's peaceful assembly and to petition the government for a readiness of grievance. It's interesting that the Supreme Court has interpreted this to limit religious practices, such as the use of peyote um, as part of our sacraments. In, 17, in 1978, the American Indian Religious Freedom Act was passed by Congress that protected the rights of Native Americans to exercise traditional religion by including access to sites, which are religious sites, use and possession of sacred objects, such as um, eagle feathers, and the freedom to worship through ceremonial and traditional rites. In 1994, the American Religious Freedom Act was amended to include the use of peyote, as I call her, Shema Azed, 
So it took us up until 1994 to actually be allowed to be to use um, peyote legally under the, the rules of the United States. My point is this, is that the laws and the policy of this country do not always apply to the original people of this country. In addition, additional loopholes are created for us to have to jump through in order to pray and in order to worship in the ways that our ancestors did. I want to talk a little bit about how we view healing. Um, the diagram on the left-hand side is, is uh, a depiction of how we see healing in the Diné culture. If you start at the very top where it says emotional, that is the direction of the East. And in this direction, it relates to prayer, but it also is uh, related to allowing one to express themselves emotionally. When you go to the South, that's the mental, which is actually using self-talk, whether it's positive, it's also, um, you know, going out and being in nature, um, being able to see the sunrise and sunsets. That is when we offer our prayers to the Holy Ones, and I'll talk about the Holy Ones a little later. To the South, to the um, West, we actually have the physical, which really has to deal with being healthy and the well-being of an individual. And then to the north, that is typically related to the spiritual. And in many in, um, indigenous and Native American cultures, this is also related to the ancestors and where our ancestors live is in the north. So let's talk a little bit about the Native American um, knowledge systems. Sometimes you might hear it referred to as the old ways. Indigenous wisdom cannot be understood from a Western perspective or a Western perspective mindset. In order for you, for you to understand Native American wisdom of healing, your Western mindset needs to be set aside in order to understand it from a child's mind. Healing is a whole system that encompasses holistic treatments, and that's with a H-O-L-I-S-T-I-C, and rituals, prayers, and chants to deities or spirit helpers. It is also the use of medicinal plants, understanding the natural world for acute and chronic conditions, and to promote health and well being. In addition, traditional healing cannot be taken out of the context of their original relationship to the four constructs of spirituality, which includes the connection to Creator and Mother Earth to community, that's our families and our tribe, to the environment, which is our daily lives, nature and balance, and the self, our inner thoughts and our values. In addition, the celestial world, which includes the heavens, is where the holy people reside, which are Dene, we call them. These are the holy ones, and these are the spiritual guides that guide us in our life. In this system, everything is connected and made of energy and as healers have the ability to tap into this energy frequency for the purpose of healing. We have healers that are diagnosticians, herbalists, chanters, sand painters, and the holy ones that help to bring balance. And then we call it hojon back into our lives. So it's bringing back into the center of everything. And I've heard of this as in the Buddhist teachings, they talk about mindfulness. And that is really what we're, we're talking about and being able to think about now. They say that if we think too far in the future, we get anxious. If we focus too much on the past and our past experiences, we get lost in that emotion. And it doesn't allow us to come back into that, that place of balance. I want to talk a little bit about um, cultural appropriation and cultural appreciation. And the reason why I wanted to bring this topic up is because when I go around, you know, the world and, and do presentations, this is a topic that always comes up because people are always unsure. A lot of therapists are unsure about what they can use and what they cannot use um, as part of their, their regimen when they're working with individuals. Um, what happens to Native Americans by the, um, I just want to say something seems to be out of order here.
Sorry about that. Earlier, I shared with you the um, kind of an overview of our colonial past and some of the policies that have impacted Native American people. Cultural appropriation is an extension of centuries of racism, genocide, and oppression. It treats indigenous cultures as free for the taking. And this is so important to understand, not only in the context of Native Americans, but also indigenous people. So people in Peru, um, you know, people in Mexico, the, the indigenous people. By definition, cultural appropriation is taking a culture out of its original context. When this occurs, it no longer has its original meaning or teaching. In the case of Native American teachings, it no longer carries the wisdom. Wisdom means that it's acquired over centuries of time, not necessarily knowledge. Knowledge to me implies that you can pick up a book and read it. And so that's something to, to understand. The taking includes intellectual properties. Intellectual properties in, in the Western society includes laws such as copyrights, patents, and trademarks and trade secrets. You know, we got to think, keep in mind that most Native American ceremonies, rituals, chants are not written down. They are passed orally from one generation to the other. And so the standard legal framework does not apply to indigenous and Native American rituals and ceremonies because they are not works of individual authorship that do not fit into the copyright framework. And that's really important to understand. To me, the disconnect is the lack of understanding of historical trauma experienced by Native American and Indigenous cultures by non-Indigenous people. Despite efforts to destroy our culture, traditions and ceremonies remain intact, partially because it is passed from one generation to the other. How do we practice cultural appreciation for ancient knowledge practiced by Indigenous and Native American people? And that is where cultural appreciation comes in. Cultural appreciation implies seeking to understand and learn about another person's culture to broaden one's perspective and to um, connect cross-culturally. We first must listen, listen to their stories because in the stories, there are lessons that need to be learned. We need to understand the implications behind the aspects of their culture that are of interest to us. And so one of the things that I find as I go around the world, there are certain aspects that people are very interested in. And so as therapists and as um, practitioners, one of the things for you individually, if there's something that resonates and I would, you know, take the time to understand it a little bit more, it might be related to your own cultures. And so by investigating that a little bit more, it helps you to be a better therapist, a better practitioner. Share your culture mutually with the indigenous and non-native persons. This is an opportunity for you to learn about yourself, someone else, and provide an understanding of each other's cultures. And so that, that exchange is always something that is always important. In the Andean cultures of Peru, there is a term called Aini which means sacred reciprocity. Today for me, tomorrow for you. At the basis of this teaching and other Native American culture, it is about a right relationship with each other and everything around us. I have gotten into debates with folks about um, the decriminalized nature movement. And one of the biggest things that for me that is um, disheartening is that there's not always the voice of a native and indigenous people brought to the table. It's after the policies that have been passed and then they want to implement and they want you to buy into that process. So that's really something to also keep in mind. What are the results of exploitation? There are many things that occur in indigenous and native American cultures as a result of exploitation. Here are a few that I might wanna highlight. When our ceremonies are exploited, it is impacted to the sacredness of the tradition. In many instances, you might be initiated into these ways of teaching, not through a weekend retreat. These initiations might be a lifetime. 
there is a potential to endanger these century old practices. Please keep in mind that many of these are not written down anywhere. What the capital model, capitalized model ignores and threatens is the inherent element that has made these sacred plants so effective and sacred. The second point is that there is a decriminalized movement around the use of sacred plant medicines. However, what is not happening is hearing the voices of the indigenous and Native American people around the teachings of these medicines. We are the guardians of these plants and their original instructions. And they say that in many Native American and indigenous cultures, there are the four races of people and the red people, which are the indigenous and Native American people. We were put on this earth to be the guardians of nature, the water, the air, the rocks, the earth. And it doesn't mean that we own them. It just means that we are the caretakers of them. With the commodification of these sacred plant medicines, there is an increased demand for them. Our Western society is a throwaway society. In an article by T Tessa Love entitled Psychedelics, Capitalism and the Commodification of the Sacred, she put it well. She says, as these substances gain widespread appeal, the voices calling for honoring the ancient ways are getting drowned out by the sound of money hitting the bank and the stampeded investors rusting in to cash in. And that is the reality that we are in today. In the cultures of indigenous and Native American people, we see things as part of a life cycle from cradle to cradle, as opposed to the Western mindset of cradle to grave. Therefore, it requires to look at what we are creating and what we are leaving for the next seven generation for our children, our great-grandchildren, we all have to make that decision. I wanna talk a little bit about some topics that relate to research, um, especially in the psychedelic assisted space. In Linda Smith's book called Decolonizing Methodologies, she says it well, from an indigenous perspective, research is typically something that is done to and about us. Again, I'm going to read that again because it's so important for you to understand. From an indigenous perspective, research is typically something that is done to and about us. There is little or no involvement by community being studied. This includes gathering of data during field work. When this occurs, Native, Native American communities feel betrayed. And there is a history of exploitation of Native American members to advance research careers failures to understand and thus misrepresent the culture, identify and then stereotyping, stigmatizing and otherwise damaging the reputation of native communities, giving little or nothing back to the communities. Keep in mind the, the earlier comment that I made about Aini, sacred reciprocity. In a study titled Inclusion of People of Color in Psychedelic Assisted Therapy, a review of the literature, it pointed out that minorities are the greatly underrepresented in psychedelic medicine studies. The study reviewed 18 studies and out of the sample of 282 participants, only 4.6% or 13 individuals were classified as being indigenous. Now you have a, now you have a better understanding why that is. Really realizing that research projects have expectations that need to be managed by the PI and research team, consideration should also be given to incorporating culturally based and traditional knowledge. Research done within the mental health field have indicated that there are benefits to including traditional healers, rituals, ceremonies, such as a talking circle, sweat lodge, and it boils down to cultural competence. There are two fundamental questions. Why is this? And what does research look like when it is decolonized? In a decolonized view of research, it is more about the manner in which the research problem, problems are conceptualized and designed and with the implications of the results for individuals and for communities. There is an established relationship both personally and professionally 
This requires building a rapport and credibility by attending community meetings, social and cultural events. There needs to be trust for traditional healers to share and open their experiences with researchers. My biggest point is that don't focus on the ceremony or the ritual, focus on the well being of the individual. That is so key to what research is about. In an article that I, I put out, I talked a little bit about the recommendation for working with Native, Indivi Native American individuals and communities. And I just wanted to highlight a couple of points that are really key. First of all, trust and respect are two fundamental keys to building rapport with Native American individuals and communities. And I see he's in the hall smiling there. So he gets that. Second of all, culturally based therapeutic models. There is a need for models that incorporate traditional practices such as talking circles, sweat lodge, prayers, etc. Fourth, healing does not only involve our physical bodies, it also includes the spiritual, emotional, and mental bodies. In my Diné culture, they say that we come into this physical realm as spirits when we are babies. It is not until we have our first lift laugh that we embody the physical. This is referred to as a first laugh ceremony. As I mentioned earlier on the topic of cultural appreciation, cultural humility is important as a, as a provider and as a therapist. If you don't understand your own inner cultures, then how do you expect to understand a different culture? I strongly recommend that you do your homework and don't expect indigenous and native people to give you the answers. The other point I wanted to make is there are 573 tribes in the United States and each one of them are very distinct in their culture and in their language. And so I wanna say, okay, thank you. And I'm gonna turn it over back to Sanal and he'll go ahead and do his presentation. Sounds good. Thank you, and thank you, and um, everybody. And it's it's an honor to to be here with you, um, Belinda, um, and and um, and hearing from you, learning from you, and it's it's glad to glad to be here with all of you, sharing that. Um, I'm gonna pull up uh, my slides, and um, as I do, I think you know the way I see it is is Belinda. I think what you had to share is is exactly what like we were you know this presentation is about. You know, I think I know from what from talking to Hope and, and the team, you know, many of you guys are going to be future researchers who are, are going to be, you know, people working in this emerging field, I guess, of um, psychedelic medicine, psychedelic rest research within the Western perspective. So I think it's really important to start from that point of appreciation. Um, and, and I don't think that that can be achieved with it without really starting to think about this, like within a larger global historical context. So I think, you know, what I want to do is sort of share a little bit from my perspective. So again, I serve as the uh, chief and program director for addiction psychiatry at the University of New Mexico. Um, and uh, my hope really is to expand a little bit in that angle about like, as, the re as we carry out research, what are some things to be mindful of? And as hopefully these, uh, these research projects, right, um, in the future become treatments, establish treatments, hopefully, right? Like what are the implications? How should we be approaching it? That's really kind of what I want to uh, focus on for the next, um, just next few minutes. Um, and again, I also start with a land acknowledgement. Um, all of my work, I came here as a fellow back in 2009 and all of my work has been done at University of New Mexico. Um, and um, University of New Mexico is established um, and sits on the traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia and the original peoples of New Mexico, uh, various Pueblo peoples, Diné, Apache, since time immemorial have deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader community statewide and continue to do so. Um, and so we want to, you know, and I want to honor the land itself and those who remain the stewards of this land throughout the generation and to acknowledge our committed relationship to indigenous peoples. Um, you know, and we gratefully recognize um, the history. 
Um, and as I do this, I also, you know, think about my own background. I, you know, I'm originally from India. I moved to this country when I was 14. And I also think about the history of indigenous peoples within India um, in many ways, not dissimilar, right? Um, including things like colonialization and exploitation um, and resilience. Um, so I also acknowledge, um, acknowledge that um, to the indigenous peoples of India um, who have in many ways contributed uh, to where I am now. And I think that needs to be said um, as I, as I kind of go through this. And I'm gonna be relatively quick. I think Belinda, you laid out the challenge. When it comes to research, you really laid it out. And this is, the, I think the study you were, you were referring to, well-published I study from 2018, showing that we're, I think we're missing the opportunity looking at these 70, 17 studies, they found that over 80% of participants were non-Hispanic white. Right, and in majority of the studies, over seventy-five percent of participants were white. I think the only exception in this study was, you know, and I'm I kind of feel uh, a little happy saying this was the uh, the study on uh, the alcohol psilocybin pilot study uh, that was carried out by Dr. Michael Bogenschutz at the University of New Mexico. I think that was the within the U.S. studies that was the only exception where the majority of participants um, were not white. Um, and, um, and similarly, I think we're currently doing and wrapping up actually our phase two alcohol psilocybin uh, alcohol study and the New Mexico portion, um, again, had majority uh, women and majority non-white participants. So I think I'm, you know, I think we want to kind of continue to build upon that. Why does it matter? Again, Belinda, you laid this out. Generalizability of results, right? I think we're missing that. And I think also we're missing the opportunity to look at things that are often important or maybe disproportionately important to, you know, to LGBTQ2 audiences or um, BIPOC audiences, right? Um, that eventually these treatments might um, help that we hope that will be, will provide some help because we're missing by not including these participants, we're missing the opportunity to really understand things like even if we study, for example, MDMA for PTSD, are we missing the chance to understand things like role of cultural traumas, historical traumas, microaggressions, which are, you know, for, for many people, unfortunately, a daily or near daily reality, or, or moreover, discrimination on therapeutic effects. So we're, we're really missing this. There was this wonderful study. There's a whole line of literature um, that focuses on, uh, on some of these issues. And this was a study from 20, 2015 that actually looked at um, the adaption of Western evidence-based treatments by clinics that are either run and administered through Indian Health Service or through, the, through various tribes in the United States to see what's the level of implementation and what are some barriers of implementation to evidence-based practices. And it was a focus group. And what they actually found was, you know, 30% uh, of the focus group participants, which were you know, community members, providers, community leaders, traditional healers, they had a wide group of people and they cited cultural relevance of evidence-based therapies as a concern that might actually prevent them uh, from implementing that or implementing that effectively. So again, thinking ahead, if these things become evidence-based practices, right? Psilocybin for alcohol use disorder, for example, or MDMA for post-traumatic stress disorder, for example. Implementation is gonna be important if we want um, equity in terms of whom these treatments benefit. And this is something we need to start thinking about now. Look at some of the quotes that I included. From the study, I pulled out two or three quotes that I thought were really telling. I think it was developed by folks that have been out in the field for a while or haven't really experienced culturalized populations because it's like saying, Sam had evidence-based treatments in Alaska, so if it works for them Alaska natives, it's going to work for the Hopi down in Arizona. And it's not true, right? Just like you were saying, Belinda, that, you know, there, each, each culture is unique and there isn't this general singular monolithic um, indigenous culture or tradition. Evidence-based just means that they have found a certain treatment approach or philosophy that helps with a certain population and it's not true for all populations. The last quote, it's hard to find anything that is native specific. There isn't data out there, right? And on the flip side is the second quote, that what if a particular 
medicine, the way you defined it, Belinda, right? Well, you know, in a broad, holistic sense, if it works for something, but there isn't Western evidence, is that invalid? And that's what that second quote is looking at. And to me, that's going to be evidence-based because it's working for that person, right? Um, there is this idea, I have a slide on it later, but kind of jumping ahead a little bit, uh, there's this idea of, um, you know, instead of um, evidence-based practice, practice-based evidence, where you take the evidence that may have been gathered through clinical studies, combine it with culture, with personal preferences, right? Um, you know, with the experience of the local providers and local community members and come up with sort of a practice that, that may be adapted to that particular culture. And I think that's really what that's getting at. I think there are also other factors contributing to inequities, funding sources, right? So far, and thankfully this is starting to change, we're finding, but there has been barriers to federal funding when it comes to psychedelic research. Right. So a lot of the research has been carried out through private donors or private entities. And I think that's expanded and continuing to expand some inequities about who gets to do the study, who gets to participate. Similarly, the cost of training to become a therapist. Right. Can sometimes be very high, again, contributing to some of these inequities. And, you know, and if you know, and I think so, that's something thankfully many people are starting to address. These spaces are being carved out and intellectual property concerns. And I have a, just a couple of quick slides on it, right? That as we know, or many of you may know, just focusing on psilocybin, which is primarily what I do kind of research within this arena, there are at least 24 past and present patents on psilocybin, right? Right now. Um, when there are no plans in any of them, as far as I know, of consultation, the sacred reciprocity, the way you defined it, Belinda, or compensation. That's not discussed, right? For example, a public tree traded company has a polymorph of psilocybin currently patented, but there is debate, can it even be patented, right? Um, you know, um, and, and who gets to benefit from that? And what is the impact of such extractive practices, right? Kind of pharmacocolonialism or molecule colonialism, whatever you wanna call it on indigenous communities. Does that then further compound the cycles of historical trauma, ironically, even as we explore these substances to help depression and PTSD, um, you know, does that contribute to some of those same things in certain communities who have, um, you know, sort of nurtured this wisdom for hundreds of years? So that's something to think about. And is it even legal, right? And I've included some examples and the slides will be shared with you. But the United, for example, the United Nations Conventions on Biological Diversity, the CBD it's called, uh, one of the largest, most widely signed UN resolutions was passed way back in 1992. The UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples passed in 2007, again with broad international support, all really kind of essentially established this idea that traditional knowledge is not and should not be an unregulated market that traditional peoples have a right to protect, preserve and develop traditional knowledge and to benefit from those development. But is that actually happening? How does this get enforced? I think these are things we as you know, Western scientists, people who hopefully are or will be contributing in this field must be mindful of, must keep in mind. So I wanna quickly then talk about my suggested approach in the next, um, just a couple of minutes. Know your lens, our lens is our worldview right? And know your own cultural background, ways in which you might be privileged and the ways in which you may have experienced things like microaggression, depression, and, you know, we, you can have both. When I think about myself, for example, you know, again, um, as an immigrant to this country, um, you know, when I was a teenager, right? Um, speaking not a whole lot of English, never had used it conversationally, um, you know, and, 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 and there were ways in which I experienced those and, and I continue to experience that. On the other hand, now as, a, you know, as the chief of a major, you know, addiction division in a university or as a PI on a number of studies, those are the ways in which I do have privilege. And those are the ways in which I have tremendous privilege. And I think it's important for me to be mindful and be able to hold both of those angles, right? Um, so I think really starting with that, is, is really important. Understand the importance of role, status, power, 
and its impact on trust on a therapeutic relationship. Expand knowledge, but remain humble. You're never not gonna know everything, right? So be humble um, and, and continue to learn, gather and cultivate. And I really think this can be done, positive attitudes towards learning about new cultures, right? Uh, so work on that. And keep in mind that cultural sensitivity is not a fixation on culture. Um, and, you know, Belinda, just like you talked about the difference between cultural appropriation versus cultural appreciation um, is something to be mindful about. Be inquisitive, not um, intrusive. Be familiar with and share your own background. Your own biases is all important. Don't assume, right? Uh, and don't generalize um, are important. Next, I think it's important to be mindful of why certain groups might be reluctant to participate. Belinda, you talked a lot about um, history of exploitation, colonialization, right? But for many uh, cultures, there is also this idea of a criminalization, incarceration. A caveat here, the next few slides might be triggering to some. Um, and I am mindful of that. Um, so please, you know, be mindful of it and turn off your screen if you need to. I'm gonna go through them quickly but these are actual you know, newspaper clippings. Um, and I received them courtesy of uh, Drug Policy Alliance. And so thank you to them uh, for uh, um, that I'm using these next couple of slides, right? Dr. Bot, yeah. um, I, hate to, I hate to interrupt you here, but we only have about four minutes left and we have some questions. I know this is really important um, material to get through, but I do want to give, since we've gone through so totally. much, Totally good. And I think what I will do is just um, do a quick slide. So be mindful of why people don't. There's a whole history of racism. Um, drug war has affected different cultures differently, right? Uh, continues to affect different cultures differently. Um, and so I think, think about that. Think about um, community-based participatory research, working closely with the communities, right? With whom you might be participating. So again, research isn't done to and about them like you said, Belinda, but there's real reciprocity and exchange of information and knowledge. Um, and I will actually end there, uh, if that's okay, Hope, because I think questions are important. So let's, I'll stop here. Thank you. Great, thank you both so much for that. Um, I believe uh, that, that Dr. Yehuda has a question to ask and further questions we can, we can address in our 5.30 gathering this evening. That's good. Yeah, I'm mindful of the time, so this might just be a question to throw out that can be answered at 5.30. But this idea of um, appropriating plants um, and really leaving them um, to not be in abundance for the communities that have cultivated them, it's a very important idea. And I'm just wondering what you feel about then the development of drugs uh, for the, maybe for the Western world, so that DMT could be in a tablet, and it, in Western cultures won't have to run to ceremonies. Um, and just what you think about that issue, because that is in a way a solution to the problem, but maybe it creates other problems. Yeah, no, thank you, Dr. Yehuda. Belinda, do you want to uh, start that off, and, and then I can kind of jump in? Sure, absolutely. Thank you for that question, Dr. Yuvita. I'm, I'm very fond of your work as well. So thank you for all that you do. Um, I did want to, to say that, um, you know, my experience, especially for instance, like with MDMA, which is synthetically made, um, but the origins of MDMA actually come from the sassafras tree. And I'll give you uh, an example. Um, when I attended the MDMA training session, one of the things, one of the big questions that I asked was, has there any been a ceremony done to let the plants know what it was being used for? And by all indications, they said, no, that was never done. And since I was in Kentucky and there happened to be a forest that had sassafras out there, I, you know, took it upon myself to go out there with some other colleagues and offer some prayers and really talk to the plants about what it is that they're doing. Fast forwarding to where we are today with the synthetic um, plants um, or the, the synthetic um, medicines that are available. Um, I think they can be honored in the same way um, because in the way that I look at it, everything is energy. And these, whether it's synthetic or it's naturally made um, from a plant, 
they all carry that that essence of energy um, and energy is different types of frequency that we can tap into and so i think it still can be utilized um, and i don't have any objections to that but again i'm only one one person i know that there are a lot of indigenous people and traditional healers that are objecting to that but we need to all come to some kind of compromise because we are all seeking healing you know as a human family and irregardless of our skin color and i think that's first and foremost that we need to look past um, how do we reach these answers and grow together in community so that we can all um, reap the benefits of, of healing and so that's kind of my general response to that question Thank you so much for that answer. And that will be a great jumping off point for our discussion at 5.30, where I think that's exactly the question that we should consider, how to bring these considerations into um, our work going forward. So thank you everyone for joining and, and we hope to see you at, um, at 5.30 this morning. Thank you to both of our incredible speakers.